there are prophecies involving Israel, involving Jewish people. Why is Jerusalem so important? Why are the Jews so important? Who's pulling the strings of Hamas and Hezbollah? Our enemies are not flesh and blood. They're spiritual principalities and powers of darkness. Who knows if you've not been called to the kingdom for such a time as this? Israel says it's at war. On Saturday, terrorists breached the border in 29 locations by land, air, and sea, according to military spokesman, Lieutenant Colonel Richard Hecht. Huge rocket barrage just targeted the city of Ashdod. We saw multiple impacts. Explosions and sirens heard in Jerusalem. More than 700 people in Israel have been murdered by Hamas terrorists since the war began. Well, our hearts are heavy. Uh, this past Shabbat, we found out that Israel declared war. Holy Spirit, please take over. Let this broadcast be holy. Let it edify God and let truth just come out of my mouth in Yeshua's name. Headlines of newspapers say deadliest attack in 50 years. I'm hearing all sorts of statistics. The one I'll go on is what Israel itself is saying, not what the reporters are saying or the Palestinians are saying. Uh, I'm going to what Israel is saying. And they say there were uh, 2,200 missiles rained in the sky. And uh, they have these iron domes, which stop the missiles from causing damage. But a lot of areas aren't even covered with the iron domes. You know, God is brilliant. Something that God did a few months back uh, that uh, we found out that we could partner with the IDF, Israeli Defense Forces, and build bomb shelters. I mean, uh, remember Schindler's List? I remember him saying, I just wish we could build one more. So uh, we, we have at this moment, and it's going to change daily, 78 operational bomb shelters in areas the IDF deemed very, very important, meaning perhaps the Iron Dome couldn't get those missiles or there was nothing close to these people. And of course, the further north you go up in Israel, the less bomb shelters that they have. But we also paid for an additional 15, which are being built or built right now. So we know for sure 78 bomb shelters that did not exist. And uh, and the numbers, by the way, by the Palestinians uh, are getting um, outrageously high. It's bad even what Israel is saying. The kidnapped, no one knows the number. But I have an interesting statistic I don't think anyone could have. I have relatives in Israel. Uh, one's my sister and brother-in-law, another's a cousin. And this is what they told me. I made two phone calls to friends in Israel to get information. Are they safe, etc.? cetera? You know, it's family. Uh, and what, what they said is both of them, one, the husband of an employee is missing. They know he's kidnapped. The other, uh, my sister said in their congregation, someone is kidnapped. Two out of two. That tells me the numbers could be very high. I don't know about whether you read this or not. There was a some sort of rock group for young teens, and they just slaughtered these teens and took the women as prisoners, the young women as prisoners. Now, it, I'm not here to tell you how about the atrocities of this war. Everywhere you look, you'll find out information that I have and maybe even worse. But let me tell you, what I have is so horrific. We're dealing with the, uh, the, the most gross type of inhumanity to man it's possible to deal with. Uh, we have a generation, and there's a group there, and get, make no mistake, these are terrorists. It happened on Shabbat. Uh, that's when the religious Jews are in the synagogue. I imagine a lot of them didn't even know it happened until they got out of the synagogue that night. Um, but uh, it was so well calculated. It was calculated air. It was calculated sea. It was calculated land. Do you know they snuck in on bicycles? 
Uh, and again, I don't want to go into the detail. You watch any newscast and you'll get the details of what I'm aware of. Uh, however, uh, I'm really concerned over the kidnapped people. Why? Because Hamas, uh, you have to, I started to say that, you have to understand Hamas is trained from infancy that you must kill every Jew you meet. They're trained. You can only have a one-state solution. From infancy, their textbooks are to kill Jews. I mean, I feel sorry for them. They're the worst of victims. And I know someone would say you shouldn't feel sorry for them, but they're the most brainwashed of brainwashed humans on the, on the earth. And uh, whether it's Trump or whether it's Biden trying to orchestrate a two-state solution, if the governments are controlled by terrorist groups like Hamas or in the north in Lebanon, Hezbollah, you can't have a two-state solution. But who's pulling the strings of Hamas and Hezbollah? It's very obvious who's pulling the strings. And you only know by intelligence, which I, information, and that is Iran. Well, what was the number I saw the other day that Biden released in money to Iran? Uh, I think it was something like uh, $6 billion. Uh, and guess what? All the weapons that were left in Afghanistan, guess what the uh, terrorist groups are using against Israel? Those weapons, that money. It's all being manipulated from Iran. And it's not even Iran. So it's important for you to understand this foundation, to understand why this is happening. I mean, you can attribute it to man's inhumanity today, man, but there's something more diabolical than that. It's not the humans that are puppets on a string. It's the spiritual principalities and powers of darkness that are our true enemies. And they can be defeated. Do you know my Bible says no weapon formed against me can prosper? That's the inheritance of the righteous. This I know for sure because it is written. That's the way Jesus attacked the devil. It is written. He didn't even say God told me. He said it is written, it is written, it is written, and I want to live my life. I want to hear from God, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But I have a sure word from God. It's the written word of the living God. And you can live and die on these words. And if you're a believer, if you're not, I'll tell you how to take care of it in a little while. But if you are a believer, whether you feel like it, whether you look like it, if you live, and that's the caveat, if you live in instant repentance, why instant? The longer you play games with sin, the more entrenched it gets. The more entrenched it gets, the harder it is to get free. But you can instantly take your thoughts captive. The Bible says that. It's not original. Take your thoughts captive to the Word of God. So I live, and I recommend you live, especially now, the most treacherous times the world has ever had, in instant repentance. What does God say? Be holy, for I am holy. Isn't it interesting, in all of Scripture, God commands true believers, if that's you, raise your hand, I'm a true believer. God commands true believers in Psalm 122, 6, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And then God bribes us to do this. I mean, as if he needed to. He says, you'll prosper if you love Jerusalem. Why is Jerusalem so important? Why are the Jews so important? because there are prophecies involving Jerusalem, involving Israel, involving Jewish people, involving the future of the world. The devil knows these prophecies. Christians know these prophecies, but we act like we don't in many cases. So God commands, interesting, only one city in scripture to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. He didn't say pray for a two-state solution. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. But there's more to loving Israel. There is loving God's destiny for Israel. God's destiny for Israel is so much bigger than anyone can see. Genesis 12, 3, another bribe, if you will, by God. 
for us to bless the Jewish people, this physical seed of Abraham. And I've quoted this, but it's worthy of putting together the case I'm building for you right now from God's word. So you can say, like I can say, like every true believer should say, it is written. It is written. Genesis 12, 3. I, God, will bless them who bless you and curse him who curses you. And in you, that's in Abraham and his physical seed, all families of the earth will be blessed. And we could say, yeah, when Jesus came, all families of the earth are blessed. But that promise, if you'll look at Scripture, continued after Jesus. And if you look at history, continued after history. And whether we Jews are ardent atheists and we point our finger at God, or whether we're orthodox religious Jews, the blessings of God are on us. Why? Because God himself said, the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Meaning when he gives us a gift. Now, if I was God, I'm not so sure I would do this on a lot of Christians, including me. Uh, when I was a new believer, that's all I want to say about that. Uh, uh, but um, God does not rescind the gifting. That's what gets tricky and will be very tricky in the last days. Someone will have a legitimate gift, but what is their character? How is that gift being used? Is it being used to manipulate you or being used in a biblical principle of sowing and reaping? There's a fine line between the two. And I think a lot of people don't know the difference. I know the difference. And I have to tell you, I work with people that are known as professional fundraisers, and there isn't a letter that goes out of here that they have not done and, they, and by the way, I write all my own letters, but I do have professional fundraisers go over it and make suggestions. Uh, and there isn't a letter that goes out that, number one, I haven't written, and number two, after the fundraiser made suggestions, I have temp tampered down, tampered down the, uh, uh, the suggestions because I will not be manipulative. Um, despite what some people accuse me of. But that's their problem with God. Why do I say that's their problem with God? Because gossip is a problem. You better make sure that your yes is yes and your no is no. Because the more you give the devil an inch, he'll take a mile. I don't want to give him an inch in my life. And I urge you not to give him an inch. Now, who owns the land of Israel? I'm glad you asked. It is written in Psalm 105, 8 to 11. He remembers his covenant, and I put in brackets. That means it's not really in the original, but it'll help you understand it better when I read some other promises. He remembers his lease. Like, you know, you rent, you rent uh, an apartment house, you lease an apartment house, you lease land. You own it, but the other person lives in it. So he remembers his covenant or his lease. Here's how long. Forever. The word he commanded, and here's another synonym for forever, for a thousand generations. So he remembers this lease or his covenant with who? Abraham and his physical seed forever for a thousand generations. And then this is amazing. He then says this lease passed to Abraham, then to Isaac, is on the 105th Psalm, and then to Jacob as a decree to Israel, and then a third synonym of the forever and a thousand generations. And then he says, for an everlasting covenant or lease, saying to you, that's the Jewish people, I will give the land of Canaan as the portion of your inheritance. And throughout the Old Testament, God refers to Israel in a term that caused me to say this covenant is a lease because the true owner of God, let me just give you one example, Joel 1, 6, for a nation powerful and innumerable has invaded my land. Whose land? My land. Who's speaking? God. Whose land is it? God's land. 
And he's given Abraham in his physical seed this lease. And he's even said when he's going to come in and rule from Jerusalem, the whole world, and Jesus will be the king, David's greater son from the seed of David. And when Jesus is the king, I can tell you the timing even. I can't tell you when, but I can tell you the event that will happen in the world. At that moment, any Jew in Israel that doesn't know Jesus will look and say, and Zechariah says, they'll weep. They'll weep because they missed the time of their visitation. They'll realize it was Jesus, one God for the whole world. That's the Jewish view, that's the Muslim view, and that's the Christian view. His name, according to it, is written, the Bible, one God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and one Messiah, not a Messiah for the Muslims, a Messiah for the Christians, a Messiah for the Jews, one Messiah for the whole world, the one that hung on the cross, that actually his title on the cross was King of the Jews. It was. Look it up in the New Testament. It is written. See, when I'm telling you everything I'm telling you, it is written. One God, one Messiah for the whole world. Yes, Sid, but there's not peace on earth, so it couldn't have been Jesus only if you're dealing with half a deck. If you deal with all what is written, you'll see in Isaiah 53 that in addition to uh, the other passages in Isaiah and, and, other, and other prophets, there'll be peace on earth, which happens to be true, but I said it's half a deck. There are just as many prophecies that say he will die. The perfect, the, the whole purpose of animal sacrifice was to have a shadow of the sacrifice lamb that would die for the sins of the whole world, Jesus. And so Isaiah 53, I read that from my Orthodox Jewish father, and he, he screamed at me. He said, close that Bible. It's a Christian Bible. You're describing Jesus. I said, Dad, I'm reading from a Jewish Tanakh, the Jewish scriptures that I got from our Orthodox Jewish rabbi at my bar mitzvah. Look at the inscription. And my Orthodox Jewish father that absolutely did not want to believe Jesus was the Messiah, couldn't say a word. Because I didn't comment on what I read from Isaiah 53. I just read the pure word of God is written, Dad, that all we like sinners have gone astray. There's none righteous, no, not one. And the Lord has laid on him, that's the Messiah of Israel, the iniquity of us all. So there are many predictions that the Messiah would die for our sins, be buried, and rise from the dead. And many predictions when the Messiah comes, there'll be shalom on earth. What gives? There's a reasonable explanation. What about just as one God, one Messiah? And what about this one Messiah coming two times, once to live a righteous life as a human, die as a human, bear the sins as Isaiah and 1 Peter 2.24 say, say, bear the sins of the whole world. By the way, there's a fringe benefit most Christians don't know about. He bore the sicknesses of the whole world at the same time. Read it in Isaiah 53. So in the Hebrew, it says he bore our diseases and illnesses, actually. So he, he, he died for us and satisfied justice. God is a just God. And that sacrifice of Jesus took care of my sins, which were many, your sins, which were many, the world's sins, which were many. Remember now, this is what Jesus was dealing with. None righteous. No, not one. Yeah, but I'm a pretty good person. Compared to who? Another person? Maybe you are compared to another person. But Joel 1 6 says, Who owns that land? Do you know what it's like? Zechariah, uh, in the Living Bible, remember that translation? It goes something like this He that touches Israel is the same as someone that pokes their finger in God's eye. 
Who would have the audacity except someone stupid, like a devil or people that are listening to the devil, to poke their finger in God's eyes? Is it becoming clear? Because everything I'm saying to you is not opinion. It is written, it is written, it is written. But oh, are there some good things that are written. If you took a look at the devil's best moves, and all you have to do is watch any newscast, conservative, liberal, nothing, any newscast, you'll find out the devil is winning. He's doing such, I don't have to tell you about it. You know about it. And he does appear to be winning. But we haven't had God's best move. And God is about ready to come center forward. In Isaiah 60, he says when he's going to become center forward. It's going, it says um, that in a time of gross, thick darkness, if that doesn't describe what we're living in, how parents could allow the school systems to mutilate their little boys and make them girls or mutilate their little girls and make them boys without their permission, you can't get much darker than that. How the world needs to be turned upside down again, that's what the world literally needs to be done. And we're about ready to see it. And there'll be a difference on what we're going to see compared to what any generation in history has seen. Now, I'm going to tell you, as great as Pentecost was, as great in the book of Acts, we read about it, as, 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 as great as the great moves of God's spirit throughout history were, I believe if you take all those moves and put them together, what we're coming into will be greater. That's why the prophets call this the greater glory, not just the glory, the greater glory. This greater glory will have a force like no one has ever seen before. It'll be unstoppable. But unlike being on one super-duper um, evangelist or apostle or pastor, it's going to be Messiah in you, the hope of glory. The average Christian will act at a stronger level than Jesus. Oh, sit. That's not written. Oh, yeah, it is. You will do this. These are Jesus' words, not mine. You will do the same works I have done and even greater. What's that mean to you? Does greater mean greater? Does to me? You are about ready. You know, just, just as um, God told Esther through Mordecai, who knows if you've not been called to the kingdom for such a time as this. If you or I could be alive at any time throughout all of history, many say, I wish I could have been a follower of Jesus when he was here in the flesh. I don't. I want to be here for the greatest harvest of souls the world has ever seen. I want to be here when the world is turned one more time upside down again. I want to be here when it's all hands on deck. I want to be here and see the greatest miracles that the world has ever seen. For the sake of miracles, you know, I have a show, it's supernatural, and some people say, well, I don't know about a lot of the things that he does. I want you to know, I do not know of another ministry that verifies as much as we do before we put anyone on the air. And is it possible to make a mistake? Welcome to the human race. I'd be God if I said, said I, it was impossible for me too. But actually, every mistake I've made, which has been, I could number on less than five fingers, every mistake I've made was when they backslid after they were on, not before and not during. So uh, as far as I know, with all the years we've been doing this, radio and TV since 1977, I think it's miraculous that I can honestly say outside of a handful less than the five fingers I have right here, there were not mistakes made on the guests. It's just the world is so sold on religious tradition. I thought we Jews had a corner on the market till I became a believer in Jesus. And I saw the Christians are quickly getting a corner on the market. We're, we're both Jews and Christians and Muslims. 
We all have a corner of the market of a famous play that was a famous movie that had a, a famous song. And you know what the song was? Tradition. Yeah, you know what that song was. And we're following tradition more than the Word of God. Sadly to say, even in many churches, in most synagogues, in most mosques. Why? These extra books. Christians have an extra book, but it is described perfectly in the Torah. Jews have an extra book, which is not described in the Torah. It's called the Talmud. Muslims have extra books, which is not described in the Torah. Christians have an extra book, which it's such a perfect description, it's better than most people realize. Isaiah chapter, no, Jeremiah 31 verse 31 says, Behold, the days come in which I, God, will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not according to the covenant I made with their fathers, which they violated anyway. But this is the covenant I'll make with them. I will put my Torah inside of them. Not, as, not that it's wrong to have the yarmulke and the talit and the, the fringes. That's fine if it makes you happy, if you want apple pie. You can have that instead of cherry. Be my guest. But that, that, if that makes you happy, go for it. But what makes me happy is it is written. It is written. It is written. But this Jeremiah 31, 31 says the Torah, the Word of God will be inside of you. It, it says that every believer will, this is different than Christianity teaches or Judaism or Islam. Every Christian will know God. No, have intimacy with God, not intimacy with your imam, not intimacy with your rabbi, not intimacy with your priest. It's nice to be have fellowship, but technically, according to the New Testament, we're all priests. So yeah, you should have fellowship with priests. That means all believers. Come on now, give, give me a break. But the third is the best of best of them all. There's all in Jeremiah 31, 31. Take a look at the new covenant. God says, I not only, like in Judaism, we cover the sins every Yom Kippur. We atone for the sins with an animal sacrifice. Of course, we haven't had an authentic Yom Kippur uh, since the temple was destroyed. If you want to follow it as written in Judaism, the Torah, you can't. With Leviticus 17.11 makes that clear. Without the shedding of blood, there is no, no, no atonement for sin. But God says in this Brit Hadashah, this new covenant, I, God, will remember your sins no more. Meaning, they're not just forgiven. And you have a little certificate say you're forgiven, but you serve prison time. No, no, no. It's better than forgiveness. God says, I, God, remember them no more. So at night when you rehearse some of the things you've done wrong, and the devil will make sure you'll rehearse that, when you do it, Remind the devil of what is written about him and remind the devil what is written about you. I, God, will remember your sins no more. So the whole deal is a chess game through principalities and powers of darkness and man's spoken word. And I want you to get this and get this well, what I'm about ready to say. It's so important. Many Christians have heard this, but few really got it in their heart. I want you to get this in your heart right now. It is imperative that you understand it's God the devil pays attention to, not us, but it's us that vocalize God's words. It's a strategic partnership. It's not us that's controlling the devil. It's God controlling the devil and us speaking God's word. So find a written promise, it is written, and you hang on to that just like David did in the 23rd Psalm. Boy, my time's slipping away, but I want to tell you this one line, it's so important. David says, in the presence, a table is set before me in the presence of my enemies. An old Jewish scholar said centuries ago that when there was military battle going on 
and one side felt they were going to win. They would have a banquet table while the battle's going on, and the king and the leaders would have the best banquet in the world and be enjoying themselves, and the other, the other army, the invading army, would look over at them and say, they must know they're going to win. They're just having fun. I'm dying here. Do you know what's going on? David was dealing with revelation knowledge. Most of us deal with sense knowledge, with fact knowledge. But that's good if that's all you have. But God has all facts. We have just what's been programmed in our brain. And we make the best decisions we can. But I'll tell you, the most important decisions I have made in this ministry caused my brain to go tilt. Confess God's promises. Believe them even if it looks like you're losing the battle. Put a banquet table in front of you and drive the devil. We Jewish people have a Hebrew word, mashoka, because here's what's happening. One more time, the greater glory of God is going to hit planet Earth. And we are going to be so filled with the glory of God, the goodness of God. We will be walking holy, not because we got rid of every tattoo. I don't have tattoos, but that's not that's neither here nor there. That's vanilla ice cream versus chocolate ice cream. Come on now. I'm talking about on the inside. Be ye holy, for I am holy, saith the Lord our God. What is going right now, right on now, is we're feeling some of the drops of the rain of the new glory that's coming. And just these drops are making a difference in every show that we're doing. But what happens when the force is so strong as a tsunami, as so strong as a, as a flood? Did you know humans, as strong as we are, we can't stop tsunamis. We can't stop floods. This move of the Holy Spirit coming from you, Messiah within you, will be a flood that will be unstoppable. And you're about ready to have the time of your life. Very important. Make see Jesus not just your savior or make him your savior for the first time. When I say just, because the word of God says we must make him our savior and our Lord. Big difference, big difference. One is a life insurance policy, the other is a lifestyle. Say, Jesus, out loud, Jesus, thank you for forgiving my sins. Thank you that you live big inside of me. Thank you that you paid the penalty for my sins. Thank you that you're my Savior. And now I make you Lord. Amen.